Yeah, it's as if you look at, I would look at my hands and they weren't connected to me. I'd look at myself in the mirror and have absolutely no idea who that person was. No connection to myself, my life, friends. I think when you lose the connection to yourself, you lose the connection to everybody else. And then therefore my creativity was gone as well. It was the oddest feeling though to look and really have no idea who I was at all. And I think that's how I didn't know how bad I looked. I was so separate from myself for so many years. And the day I was actually back in my skin, it was incredible. I wanted to sleep and that one sleeping pill led to heart medication, more sleeping pills, anxiety medication, muscle relaxers, painkillers, stomach pills, and literally, I mean, I was emaciated. I, I looked horrible. I lost my hair. My skin turned gray. You know, I, I looked like I had cancer or some serious disease, and I, it, was, it was 10 years of absolute and total hell. You know, and then I woke up one day and wanted my life back. Welcome, Alessandra. Thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. Well, you've had quite an experience. You know, tell us the first medication or prescription you were given and, and really what happened. It was quite interesting. Well, it's actually two different segments because I was involved in a very serious car accident. So okay. I've had 34 surgeries. Wow. Uh, I've had my legs, you know, were crushed. So I had reconstructions, my wrist, my shoulder, and my spine. Okay. I've had 14. So the early medications had to do more with the management of pain for the surgeries. Right. I right. have my surgery and I have, you know, the scripts for painkillers and I get on with my life. It's the second segment that caused the biggest issue for me. And that started with a very, I was going through a really horrific divorce. And oh. it was on the heels of a surgery and I couldn't sleep. And so I was prescribed a sleeping pill. And that's what started kind of a 10 year segment of tremendous overprescribing. And I declined dramatically and had absolutely no idea that it was coming from all the pills. You kind of get caught up in this. And your story is, is very illustrative. It's a great example of you go in for a, a particular problem and then it just starts to spiral and spiral and then go out of control. And so one of the things we want to talk about when we come back is that you know, how, do you, how do you take control of that situation? We'll hear from Alessandra and find out how one prescription turned to many and, and led to a nightmare. Please stay with us. So we, when we left you, we were talking to Alessandra and, and she talked about how she just had some difficulty with sleeping and then kind of led to a nightmare. Tell us what happened, please. Well, I mean, it started so innocent, you know, and when I was prescribed, I went in, it was actually my general practitioner that I went to see and, you know, asked if I was sleeping and I had a lot of pain, there's no doubt, because I had had a, you know, at that point, I think it was a knee surgery, um, but I was going through a great deal of stress and she prescribed, you know, one sleeping pill. And at first they work, and I think that's the deceptive part, because you think you have a pill that's very much the savior. You know, and so I started on it. What I didn't know is that it also suppresses breathing. Yeah. Okay. And I started developing bronchitis. Started having a lot of lung issues and ended up on inhalers. Um, no concept at all that it could be coming from the sleeping pill. I, I think sometimes people that have an adverse reaction to a drug, they know right away that there's a danger. But for people like me that tend to metabolize drugs more normally, it builds over time. And so it was more of a slow decline in health. And you don't even realize it. Plus, mm -mm. anybody who, has no. a, who couldn't sleep or has a problem with insomnia, it is horrific. So, but, but tell us, so you went from, from just a sleeping pill, now you had bronchitis, oh, you're so taking I, more medication. Oh, then and, then, and then the, the, I mean, I looked back. It took actually going through all my medical records to piece the story wow. together, because when I was living it, I just knew my health was declining. But then my heart started skipping beats, and then I was referred to a cardiologist. So I went from a pulmonologist, now I've got a cardiologist on the team, and I'm on heart medication. Then more pain started coming up, and I was given, then of course sleep declined even worse, more you know. sleeping medications. Oh yeah, more sleep medications. And then of course my pain started increasing terribly, more painkillers. Then I had muscle spasms, muscle relaxers were added. My stomach started hurting. You know, I had a scope put on my stomach and I ended up on stomach medications. You know, then I was getting depressed. I mean, my health was failing. What's, and, what's missing here, and if you're following the story at home is, no point guard. Anybody who plays basketball knows if you have a bunch of forwards, bunch of centers, bunch of you know small forwards, nothing's going to happen. You had no point guard that was coordinating any of this. You was going from one specialist to another. So, but keep going, please. But, but what's interesting is I had to see a general practitioner to get the referrals. Correct. But each item that came up was treated like a whole new injury. So my heart was treated separate. Nobody from, saw the whole picture. No. 
Yeah. Not one person sat down, you know, and said, wow, these are actually side effects from sleeping pills or anxiety medications, is that it suppresses breathing or pain increases. How, if, many, how many pills do you end up with? Over a thousand pills a month. I was on about 12 scripts, a thousand <laughs> pills a month. And my pain was so severe that I had an implant put in my spine. It's a wow. dorsal stimulator. Where it, and for those who don't know what it is, it, it, it blocks the pain signal from the brain. And there's a pacemaker embedded in the body with a remote that you carry to turn up or down the signal. And it has leads that go all the way up the spine. And I had that for seven years. Wow. And it kept failing and it had to be re-implanted. Never once occurred to me. And then finally, I mean, it was an interesting set of events that, that, that woke me up. Because, so tell me, I was going to ask you, what finally happened? Well, it wasn't anything, you know, my epiphany came as a result. I mean, my, my care was basically bookended at this point, besides a few specialists, like cardiologists, pulmonologists, from a psychiatrist that had me on, you know, three sleeping pills at this point. Okay, I had two anxiety meds, one sleeping pill, two antidepressants, and then I had a pain management that had me on a slew. I mean, my last prescription for painkillers that he wrote me was for 500 with 10 refills. Wow. To give you an idea. 500. Yeah, and they were Norco, which is, you know, like. It's a very strong. Okay. Yeah. The, and the thing is, that's, that's very, very apparent to me is nobody's looking at your medical mm -hmm. list because, I mean, whoever was taking care of your pain did not see the others. Mm -mm. other pills and it was taking care of your stomach it's all in isolation this is my this is my little world i'll exactly. manage it and whereas everything was related to one another and, and were you going to one pharmacy to do all this one pharmacy wow. and every time i went in to wow. see my doctors they'd have me fill out my little you know intake saying what are you taking and i put every single thing i was taking how often i was taking it and still i think most subset you know, there's these little areas within medicine. They still only looked at theirs. And I went to one pharmacist. I stood in line. I was very rulesy. And here's why it happens. Yeah. is because you see the pain medicine doctor, they have five minutes allocated exactly. for you. And they want to, maybe they want to help you, but what's happened in American medicine, this has got to change, is that you are stressed to the max to be able to see a patient in such a little period of time that you can't afford to see a list like yours. It, it's, it's amazing. You definitely should. It's, it is your duty as a practitioner to do that. But what happens is that people try to fit in everything in that three minutes. They say, okay, I'll just look at my medications. She's on this gabapentin and something else. That's not my deal. I'll let the primary care doctor. And the primary care doctor has even less time because exactly. he's dealing with everything else. And so, so what happened? What finally made you say, okay, I've got to do something about this? Well, it was two real significant events, okay? One is I ended up moving, okay? And I lost my scripts. So I went into, the best thing that could I, yeah, I lost it. And I was actually out of state at that point. I was actually in Santa Fe. And I um, called my doctor who, who got pretty furious because a lot of triplicates, they were, they were controlled yeah. medicines, yeah. okay? And I ended up actually in the emergency room and that was a real blessing because the, there was a general practitioner that she just focused on the pain in my spine that was so, so severe. Okay, and she actually realized that the diagnosis I had given was given was wrong, and I had ruptured my spine. And she and said like, one important thing, and I want to allude to that is that the, it is a primary care doctor that you really need in in situations like this who really cares and can get that diagnosis. We have to take a break. When we come back. We'll also give you solutions with Alessandra. What you can do if you're in that situation. What she did to to break out of this. Next, please don't go away. Thank you. And I know that we're back with Alexandra, and she was saying you're taking a thousand prescriptions a, a month, right? Yeah. Yeah, and one thing, you know, we were talking off stage is that that she was actually home on. You, you couldn't leave your house. Oh, my world kept shrinking. I mean, that's what was so shocking. I went from traveling the world and, you know, I was very active in international business to then I was afraid to be in my car, and by the end... Why were you afraid to be in your car? Because everything, I think that's part of the um, addiction to anxiety medications. Oh. Okay, things like Klonopin and Ambien sleeping pills. Is all of a sudden a lot of fear starts to come in. And I would be afraid to open the door or go to the grocery store. Because what anything. would happen? What could happen? Oh, it I was see. that impending doom, and that's what Michael Jackson went through as well, you know, because of his addiction. Yeah. It's, it's a terrible feeling, and so my world kept shrinking. Until the end, it was, it was so tiny. And then the morning, I mean, I remember it so clearly. The morning I woke up, I was going to start my day like any other, and I went to open my medicine cabinet and actually saw myself. I mean, I did not realize how far. Well, saw yourself in the mirror. Yeah. I mean, really looked at myself, though. 
you know, it's funny how you can go in day in, day out and not see who you are. And I saw, you know, that ghost looking back at me. And I just said, I, wanna f I don't know who I'll be without all these pills, but and I want to find out. that's not who you wanted to be? No. And you said right then no. that you want to no. make a change. I just, that's just want to find out. Okay. Well, you, you clearly didn't need to be all these medications. No. <laughs> you know, I'm a healthcare professional, and I'll, I'll ask you. I mean, do you think we let you down? Well, you yes. can be honest. I mean, yes. you really, I want your honest I do. answer. I do. Yeah. I think there's a place for medications. I mean, I've, like I said, I've had 34 surgeries. Pre-surgery to be given an anxiety med? Of course. Painkillers? Of course. I think being sent home, you know, and with so many pills, and, and these pills, have not had clinical trials for years and years. They're very short windows of time. And yet we're given these pills with really no exit strategy, and there should be. Yeah. Okay, and, and I think it's... And what she's saying is that, you know, you're given, this, given these pills, right? So how do you taper off them? Do you taper off? Do you stop all of a sudden? And some of these questions either are not known or we are not trained properly in how to do that because lots of different specialties use lots of different medications and they're not, we're not always trained in how to appropriately taking off the medication. Some are, I'm not saying all of, all, of, all of society, medical society is like this, but it can happen. So you're absolutely right. How, and, and when did you finally stop? What did you, what did you do? Well, that's a whole interesting situation yeah, because it wasn't quite as easy getting off of them as I thought it would be. Yeah, it's something that happened. Okay, and I went back to see my doctors and they both said, no, you can't, you need these pills. So you know you can't? You can't, yeah, that would be a mistake. You know, oh. you'll have pain forever having anxiety. I mean, I was told many, many reasons, and I just said, but I want to see who I am. So I just started cutting them down. That's, he just said, you can stop if you want. I had no idea what to do. how addictive they are. I that, mean, I think, okay. that, I think, is wrong, is that you should be given some guidance. You know, I don't think you can just say, well, do what you want and uh, stop it. That's, that's clearly, I would believe that that's not doing your job well. I, will, I, I, I don't think anybody would disagree with that, but go ahead. So what did you do? Well, and I don't think a lot of physicians know how to come off these. You know, it, it, they'll just, you know. But if you don't know, then get somebody who can. It's totally. That's what I do. Totally. You know, there's something I don't deal with very often. I just say, you know what, let me find out who can help you better. Because there's no ego here. It's we're all in it for you and not for ourselves, right? If you can't do it, there's somebody who can. So you refer them out. But anyway, so what did you, you were well, on your so own. Well, so then I started cutting do? them down based, you know, on what he said. You can cut them in half for a few days and stop. Well, you know, my immune system was so weak from yeah. all these years on pills and, and all the surgeries that I contracted a staph infection. And it wow. went then my implant in my spine became very inflamed and the, the pacemaker had to come out. I spent months in the hospital, IV antibiotics, because the staph settled in my bones and my heart. And uh, some of the doctors wanted to do open heart surgery, you know, pig oh valve replacement. Gosh. Oh, it was serious. Um, and finally the staph began to get, and then the entire device in my spine had to come out. So it came out in segments as the staph inf infection spread. Two weeks post-op from that, I contacted a, uh, I still had the staples in my spine, and I contacted a treatment center in Utah, and I went and I went cold turkey off everything. Wow. And oh my God. Did you feel like crap? I mean, I couldn't even sit down for 18 days. My body was so agitated. I hallucinated terror, absolute terror, because when you're coming off anxiety meds, you know, the reverse of that, the withdrawals are extreme anxiety. You know, sleeping pills is extreme insomnia, and so... You're getting and, and, all that at the same time. Oh, just through the roof, pain. And when I went there, I, I expected to keep the painkillers. I was post-op. didn't occur to me that, that they had a different perspective on painkillers, so I went cold turkey up. Everything. Everything. Ooh. Everything. And, and when I first got there, I was a bit arrogant because I saw a lot of illegal drug addicts, and I thought I was in the wrong place. I thought, well, I, that's not me. Is that right? That's not me. Yeah. Because I was taking them as prescribed. Correct. I didn't doctor shop. Correct. Okay. I didn't crush them. I didn't do anything weird. And then in about a week, 10 days, I saw them all feeling much better and playing and having good times doing basketball and shooting pool. And I couldn't even see. I was so sick. You know, wow. I had to walk along the wall with my hands because I was so dizzy. And I wish I had chosen illegal drugs. It would have been a lot easier than wow. getting off legal pills. Right. It prescription, was, prescription drug use sometimes is, 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 is more challenging, like you talked about, than even some of the illegal drug use that we have in this country. And, oh. and, and the lessons, you know, I think from what you're saying, if you're watching, saying, what can I learn from this, is number one, is that when you start to, this, this spiral, 
that you've started to, to have is that be proactive, be an advocate for yourself. Don't always think that everybody, that all the pills you're taking are right for you. Ask questions and say, listen, you know, do I need to be in all of these questions, all these medications? Just two days ago, I was telling Alexander, one of my patients, her family member said, Doctor, I know you're a gastroenterologist, but I have these 20 medications. Can you help me to, to tell me which one of these medications my sister, she doesn't have to get? to take, and there are at least six duplicate medications of the same class and the same thing, and we helped her. But that's the kind of thing you have to do. Thank you so much for sharing Thank you. You know, so much of your life with us. I really appreciate it. Yes. Hi. Hi. I would guess that you have seen people, even family members who have been over-medicated. What advice would you give to these people in addressing the issue? It's a great question. So if you have a family member, then what, what do we do? Alessandra, you've been through this. Yeah, I mean, what, yeah. what, do you, what do you tell them? It's tricky because it, it, part of the issue is the individual. And for years, I wasn't willing to listen when, if anybody told me because I was declining. You could see my personality changed so much. I started separating from people, and I wasn't willing. So I, I think gentle initial is do you realize how much you're changing? Do you realize you're slurring your words? I was a writer, and I couldn't write at all. Um, you know, the individual has to be ready. I mean, I had to be ready to make a lot of changes when I got off the meds because mm -hmm. my course on life had to change. And some people need some coaxing into it. If you think they're at danger driving, for instance, or doing something in their work, that's one thing. Then you got to be a little tougher. But if it's more that they're sedentary, you just have to gently remind them who they used to be. And, and you know, show them that you care. Yeah. The most important thing, I think, is that obviously, everything you said, but show them that you're on their team, that it's not an attack mode, like, I can't believe you were taking 50 pills. That's unbelievable. Because remember, you we know? think they're safe. Right. Okay, and we think that because they're legal and they're prescribed, that they're totally safe. So I would get defensive because I thought of it, this is my medical treatment, is how I deemed it. Not that I was taking too many pills. And then be their partner with it. And, totally. and, and, and don't get discouraged. They say no and reject you because like anything else in life, it's, if it's difficult, it's going to take once, twice, three times, but show them that you care, that you're on, that you're on their team, that you're not an adversary, Tell that me. you're not attacking them because you know it's not them. And if they lash out, remember it's always not always their personality because they're often medicated and the personality that they have is very different. So great yeah. question. question. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm taking a few multiple medications that I really don't think I need. So I was wondering, how do I get off of those, and what are some resources that may be available to me? It's tough, isn't it? Because you're taking all these medications, and as Alexander pointed out, it just pile up on you, and then all of a sudden you're like, well, what's going on? And then you don't know where to go to, because yeah. in, yours, in your case, they may say, well, you know, kind of stop it. What resources are out there for them? It, it depends on which medications, okay? Because sometimes if it's like a combination of, let's say, blood pressure, stomach medications, um, I mean, often you can get help from the pharmacist, mm -hmm. strangely enough. If it's something that's more addictive, whether it's like the anxiety medications, antidepressants, sleeping pills like I was, I mean, I, I actually started a nonprofit just for that reason. What's which that is called? A bit of, it's called Point of Return. Okay. Yeah, Point of Return. That's actually kind of a clearinghouse, and we, and we work in f uh, conjunction with physicians to kind of help line up, mm -hmm. you know, and, and so that people can taper safely under medical. Don't do it on your own. Don't do what I did. My blood pressure went through the roof. I was in stroke range. And I just had never had high blood pressure, so I didn't know what the ringing in my ears was. I had no idea. So you, you definitely need some help to do it correctly. And, I, and I, I'm glad you brought that up. You know, mm -hmm. when we were talking to Alessandra, she quit everything cold turkey. That is not the way to do it. <laughs> no. Because you could die. I mean, she could have yeah. died easily. Yeah. Great question. We have to go now, but thank you so much thank for your you. time. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. We come back for this prescription. Please stay with us.